If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 27. We are winding down the book of Acts, and if you have been chronologically following us, we are coming up on two years in the book of Acts. And we have looked at verse by verse all the way through the book of Acts, and I hope you have been as blessed as I have been uh, by studying it and looking at it. And today is an exciting, uh, really, really scripture. All the scripture is wonderful scripture, uh, but there's some exciting scripture here. I want to talk to you today about Paul's voyage to Rome. Paul's voyage to Rome. And let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin and want to follow us uh, there. Real simple. Number one, the start. You got to start somewhere if you're going somewhere. Two, the stay. The stay. You need to know when to stay. When to stay. And by the way, I might as well get it out here already. We are not a patient generation. Okay, patience, I believe, is the last of the nine fruits of the Spirit that we master as Christians. We all need more patience. And number three, the storm. There's storms in life, folks. You can't go around all the storms. You will go through some of the storms. But I'm telling you, as we have sung today, we are not alone in the storms of life. If everyone abandons us as a Christian, we still have Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And He will get you through every storm of life. You know, Paul had gone through so much pain and persecution up to this point in the book of Acts. Through it all, he trusted that God would keep his promise and see that he would get to Rome. Early on in Acts, uh, he had the desire to go to Rome and, and talk to the emperor, Caesar. Luke was truly a great writer and historian that filled the pages of Acts with much detail. In his writing, you can really see what a strong Christian leader and example Paul was to all around him and to Dr. Luke personally. Paul had a vision with God's will top priority in everything he had done. He was always on the move, looking for more opportunities to share the gospel and start new churches. He could make tough decisions during extremely challenging situations in life. Paul was a people person who knew how to get the job done for our Lord and Savior. His prayers were answered, and he was on his way to Rome but getting there would be a huge challenge. Let's look at the start. Acts 27.1, And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan uh, regiment. And here we start on the journey, and Paul was not the only prisoner there. There were some indications that there were other prisoners, uh, and Paul was more like under house arrest than just arrest. Uh, and, and when we're talking prisoners, and the reason I think there were some really rough guys was who they sent, uh, this Jul Julius. And when it talks about August Augustian regiment, it, it would be like what we call special forces. If something needed to get done, if there was a question of danger or a question of getting someone to point from point A to point B, they would get this Julius and his band of soldiers. So it was highly guarded. They were highly trained, and they all were getting on a boat. And by the way, the ship that they started in wasn't that big, okay? Uh, and, and you have to see, if you know where Jerusalem is, most of you have looked at the Bible and looked at the maps, uh, Caesarea just went straight west, and that's where they ported. Then they went to Sidon, so they went north. And once they get to, got to Sidon, they had to start west, and that was the longest track west. And because of the size of this ship, he didn't get out, they didn't get out in the open waters, okay? Because you have to understand, being a sailor, and folks, Paul knew what he was doing. Paul had been shipwrecked three times already. So Paul, while that wasn't his main trait, we knew he was a tent maker. He'd been on ships that had went down before. He knew something was not right all along. Verse 2, so entering a ship of Andremium, we put into sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. 
uh, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And this Aristarchus uh, was a great friend of Paul's. Uh, he first appeared in Acts when uh, he was seized by an angry mob in Acts chapter 21. Aristarchus also accompanied Paul to Jerusalem uh, with the offering from the Gentile churches. He became Paul's personal attendant for the trip to Rome. He took his doctor. Dr. Luke was with him also, and, and Aristarchus was his personal attendant. This shows Aristarchus' great love and loyalty to Paul because you will see he was described, Aristarchus, as a prisoner. Not that he had done anything wrong, but he was to be with Paul at all times. And there was uh, indication historically that Paul probably earlier had led him to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we see uh, who is going there. Now look at verse 3. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And the trip there was only about 80 miles uh, in just a, a day's order there. Uh, it was kind of like smooth sailing and everything went there. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. And when you think of Sidon, uh, again, north of Jerusalem, all right, in Syria and there, he, he uh, taught there. He planted a church there. So many of these folks that were inside on knew that this ship was coming in and word that Paul was there. And it shows you how quickly Paul made friends with Julius. Because here is a so-called prisoner, but yet if you talk to Paul, if you uh, had fellowship with Paul, you would, knew, you would know that uh, this is not your typical prisoner. Okay, He appealed to Caesar was why he was on that boat. But very quickly, Julius uh, picked up on that and realized that this guy's not going to be a problem. I'm going to give him leadway that I would not give your normal prisoner in chains. Verse 4, And when he put out to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds uh, were contrary. And folks, when you are on the sea, the winds meant everything. It meant when you sailed. It meant the direction that you sailed. It meant whether you were going to be safe while you were sailing. So when they got to Sidon, they started going west. And the island of Crete was there. And they were going between Crete and Asia, just to give you a mental picture of what was going on. And when uh, we sit, had sailed over the sea, which is off Sicilia, in Pamphylia, we came to Myra, the city of Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. And the reason he did that was the length of the trip, and also because uh, it was starting to be fall time, and there were just certain times you did not, uh, you did not sail, especially during winter times. And even at the fall, there was some times that it was suspect. This ship was a huge ship compared to the other ship. It was an Egyptian grain ship. And the Egyptians supplied Rome with grain, so there would be much cargo there. There would be much grain. There would be much weight there, and it would actually hold 276 people. So we're not talking about a small ship here, folks. We're talking about a huge ship compared to what they were on. Then verse 7, And when we sailed slowly many days. Why? Because of the wind. All right, Because they were budding a westerly wind and arrived with difficulty of sinus, sinus. Uh, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Solon. The next group there would be about a 130-mile trip and it took a long time to do that. In verse 8, in passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of La Cie. And again, you're just seeing the travel log here. But what I want you to see is, folks, things are not always as they seem. Okay, They had some difficulty here. But again, when you hear the word, this is what stuck out to me. Fair havens. All right, you think 
man, that's got to be a place that we could stay. All right? And even in our Christian life, folks, you, you know, just like Paul, Paul was always on the move. Paul was always doing things, all right, for our Lord and Savior. But Paul had something that, that the people, the, the, the experts did not have, even the expert sailors, all right? He had discernment in his life. He knew when to go. He knew when to stay. He knew when to say something. He knew when not to say something. The Holy Spirit was just welled up in him, and you could, you could, just, you could trust his word and trust his judgment. And let me tell you what happens in life sometimes, because it's happened to me. Sometimes we have great victories in our lives, and we hit cruise control. Okay? And let me just warn you, beware of cruise control as a Christian. Beware of that. Beware of those soft winds that are blowing. Because we tend to get lax during that time. Hold your finger there and go with me to Joshua chapter 7. I want you to see this. Joshua chapter 7, an Old Testament example of folks that got lax in what they were doing. Joshua led the children of Israel, and everybody remembers the battle of Jericho. Everybody remembers it was a fortified city. Walls were everywhere. They said it, they, that it, couldn't, uh, they, it could not be defeated, but yet they defeated, that, they defeated the people of Jericho. And then picking up, they moved on to the next town, which was Ai. And folks, Ai was a small city. Ai was something that was, was real small. Didn't have a lot of soldiers, but yet... I believe they took them too lightly. Look at verse 2 in Joshua 7. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are are few. And folks, sometimes in our lives, we take things too lightly. Let me tell you something, folks. Satan is always waiting for you. He's waiting for for you to get lax uh, just waiting for you to take something lightly. Say, and, and, and we make statements like, ah, oh, this is not going to hurt me, or this is no big deal. Folks, we need to take every warning from God seriously. Seriously. Verse 4, so about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men and chased them from before the gate is far of Sherebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. They had just been on a high. They were on the mountaintop at the defeat of Jericho. But yet they got lazy. They, they just said, and, and, and you know, they overlooked their opponents. And folks, I am telling you, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to get comfortable. He wants us to take days off. He wants us to take things lightly. And we cannot do that as Christians. We need to keep going forward, keep marching on for Christ, noticing and, 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 and being able to see spiritual attack. Folks, spiritual warfare is everywhere. Every day Satan gets up trying to figure out how to trip you up. And we as Christians need to be on guard. So we see the start. It seems like everything was going well. But I'm telling you, as you read on, you can see Paul knew something wasn't right. So we see the start. Now let's look at the stay. In verse 9, the stay. Now when much time had been spent, and sailing now was dangerous because of the fast was already over, Paul advised them. And again, You know, we were talking here probably the month of October. 
and you just starting in October, you did not sail out on the open seas. From November uh, to somewhere in February, you didn't even attempt that. But because they had lost, it says much time. They had lost a lot of time. All right, They had a decision to make. Were they going to stay put or were they going to move on? And the fast they were talking about was the Day of Atonement. And here's what Paul said. And folks, if you'd have been around Paul very long, you would have said, if Paul says it, we need to do it. That's the confidence uh, I had, I would personally have in him. He was close to God. He was a man of God. He had discernment. He had high moral character. He could make decisions in the worst of times. In the most difficult times, he could make good decisions. And Paul advised him, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Now, that alone would have been enough for me. That alone, and, and again, maybe if I was a prisoner, I wouldn't have any choice. But if I was up there and I heard this conversation going on, I would find another way to get where I was going. Because, you know, he, he had prophecy in him. He had the gift of the Holy Spirit, a strong gift of the Holy Spirit inside of him. And he stands up to these sailors and stands up to the centurion and says, guys, you're making a huge mistake. Folks, if somebody warns you of something, if somebody, and, and again, I know you can't just go by what other people say, but you need to weigh these things out. You may not be able to see what, what other people see. Sometimes we almost get too close to something, almost too close to where our vision is blocked. And Paul is trying to tell them, don't do this. Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken of Paul. Why would he listen to them? One is, they probably had much more experience in sailing. The second thing is, they had a job to do. Okay? And time was money for them. If they were in harbor and they were waiting a few months to sail again, nobody was making any money. So the, the, the whole premises, the whole thing of, of why they were doing was about money. All right? They weren't concerned about the safety of those. And they weren't concerned about what Paul was saying. So Julius, even though you could tell he, he had become a friend of Paul, he caved in to the owner of the ship and the ship's captain. Verse 12, And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, our harbor of Crete, opening towards the southwest and northwest and winter, and winter there. And folks, I don't know if they took a vote or what exactly happened. We had Paul on one side, and his vote was not to go. Then we had three, three people against him. Three to one was the vote. And can I say this to you folks? The majority is not always right. I want to say it again, folks. The majority is not always right. There are going to be times in your life you may be the only one that feels this way. And we as Christians, listen, we need to stand up. Okay? We need to speak our peace. And I'm not talking about in a malicious or hateful way. Don't be condescending. Don't act like you know we're super spiritual or something like that. But I, I believe Paul was pleading with them and saying, guys, I'm telling you, you're making a huge mistake. And they followed the majority there. And you know what the issue was with the captain and Julius and all of them? They did not wait. They did not wait. Folks, there are some times in your life that God tells you to wait. And it's hard. 
I mean, we pray for something, we pray for something, and we pray for something, and what we want is an automatic answer. Yes, God, answer this. Please, answer this right now. And you have to understand, folks, God, there's three answers you can get from God. Number one is yes. You can have this. This is good. You can do it. Man, go for it. And then there's a no. You don't need this. All right, this is not going to help you grow in your faith. This is not going to make you a stronger Christian. And then the one we don't like, wait, wait. Go with me to Isaiah. Hold your finger there and look at Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Aren't you glad we have a God that waits on us? Folks, I'm telling you, I ran for God for 22 years of my life. I knew about God. I was around people and Christians, but yet still, I didn't want to make that commitment. I was not ready to sell out. I was not ready to give my whole life, my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. And I thank God He gave me three chances for salvation. Man, I, I, I played baseball all my life. And folks, one of the hardest things when I played, uh, it was hard to strike me out. I had great hand-eye coordination. And I put the ball in play all the time. And I'm just giving you that example is, folks, I had two strikes on me when God came to me the last time. I had two strikes against me, but yet God waited for me. God waited patiently for me. And folks, we need to learn to wait on God. And therefore, He will be exalted, that He may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Folks, if I, I believe with all my heart that if I'd have kept going in baseball, I would have never become a minister of the gospel. And God took the most important thing away from me. My whole life was around playing baseball, professional baseball. That was my whole life. And he allowed me to be hurt uh, uh, physically where I could not play so that he could get me where I needed to be spiritually. Now this is the verse. Look at this. Blessed are those who wait for Him. Oh folks, you want the blessings of God in your life? You need to learn to wait, folks. Wait on His will. Wait on His timing. Wait on Him in situations in life. We get out ahead of God and things start messing up and we wonder what went wrong. These guys did not think it through. These guys, even being sailors, did not even use logic because they were going to head out in the winter months, which you're not supposed to do. You're taking chances. You're putting other people's lives in danger. And Paul tried to tell them, wait, you need to wait. Numbers chapter 13 I want to give you another Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I'm telling you folks, we don't teach and preach enough. Numbers chapter 13. And remember the exodus of the children of Israel and they come to the place of Kadesh Barnea and they were at the edge of the promised land in Numbers 13. And they decided to send 12 spies in. 12 spies, and they looked at all that was going on there, and, you know, they, they saw the land, and they saw, they, they saw grapes, you know, the size of cantaloupes, all right? They saw things that was just amazing. This was, uh, you know, flowing with milk and honey and all these resources, and God had told them, man, you need to go, you need to go. But I'm telling you, 10 of the men said and gave a bad report and said, no, hey, what they're saying is true, but we cannot defeat them. We cannot defeat them. Man, they're giants. They're giants. And folks, I'm telling you, we all have our giants in life. Things that we are afraid of. Things that we have not given to God. 
things that we think we can get through on our own. And folks, Caleb here and Joshua was trying to tell them, uh, hey, you need to go in. God already told us He's going to bless us. God already has given us the land. Look at verse 30. Numbers 13.30, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Folks, there is nothing in life you can't overcome with God's help. He has given us the victory. But yet some of us will just sit on the sidelines. Some of us will just quit because it's too hard or we don't think we can do it. And folks, Satan plays mind games with you. He loves to remind you of your past. And folks, we cannot live in the past. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new adventure. Every day is a day with our Lord and Savior. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. What did they do? They quit before they went in. They just says, we can't do this. Folks, let me quote you some scripture here. Philippians 4.13. What is it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is nothing you can't do without Christ. I mean, with Jesus Christ, you can do anything. Some of you sell yourself short. Some of you, you know, do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of you just... You, you just think, you keep saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, you're right in one sense. You can't, but He can through you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they'd spied out. The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours our inhabitants. Okay, what are they saying? I mean, they're playing it up big time. They're basically saying we will be destroyed. Even though God told them to go. Even though God told them that, they would, that he would be with them. And, and we saw all the people whom we saw, men of great stature. And we saw giants, descendants of Antnek, uh, uh, who came from giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their side. And so were in their side. And I'm telling you, these ten spies talked them out of going to a land that God said was theirs. Folks, you know the rest of that story. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness because of fear. Because we can't. Oh, folks, don't sell God short. Don't doubt the power of God. God is there. God can, and if He brought you to it, He will get you through it, folks. That is our God. So we see the start. We see the stay. And I want you to see, number three, the storm. And when the wind blew softly, supposing that they have obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. And you have to understand, this journey should have only taken a, you know, uh, about two to three hours. It was only... Uh, where Fair Havens was, it was just going. You just turn the corner and you go up about forty miles. You would think this would be an easy thing to do, but uh, God had other plans for them. Verse fourteen. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose, called the Euryclidon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. The deal there. Uh, the Euryclidon is what they call a northeaster. And even that word there literally means typhoon. Typhoon. So we're not talking about a strong headwind here, folks. We are talking about rain. We're talking about wind. We're talking about the sea being churned up. We're talking about waves coming over the boat, uh, the boat side and the ship side. We're talking about bobbing up and down. And folks, I've been on one ship and I paid good money on a vacation to take a, uh, a, a, a sunset cruise and dinner with me and my wife. And you know what? 
I spent more time in the bathroom than I did at my table. And we weren't, we weren't even on the, the big part of the sea. I got so sick. And I even asked for a re- my refund. I said, no, you, you were on ship. You're not getting your money back. But my point is, folks, that was a small thing there. This was huge. Okay, you're talking about huge storm. Huge storm in life. And basically... They let her drive. They could not do anything. They could not move one way or another, so they just let the ship go. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, which is uh, exactly south, and that was not the way they were wanting to go, by the way, we secured the skiff with difficulty. And a skiff is the lifeboat, all right? Even on those days, they had lifeboats And uh, I'm sure it was filling with water also. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing lest they should run aground on the uh, Syritus sands. They they struck sail and so were driven. And the securing of the the, the cables was, was a thing called frapping back then. And they would have these extra cables on board for a storm like this. And they would literally wrap the front of it and wrap the back of it and tighten those up so that uh, you know when you hit these huge waves and all that was going on, the ship wouldn't just bust into pieces. Are you getting the, what is going on, folks, here? We're not talking about a little storm on a lake. All right, we're talking about tempestuous storms, raging storms in open water. In verse 18, and because we were exceedingly temptingly tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. They probably started with the grain. Okay, you can replace grain, folks. And I'm sure they had a lot of grain. They would not have that big a ship, and, and they would not do all that, so they started chunking the grain off. Because the lower you were in the water at that time, the more you were susceptible to the waves and all that was going on. And on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now you're throwing stuff that they used to sail with. Okay, these are things that help you sail. But they were realizing that, hey, we're still way too low here. We, and they just started chunking poles off, chunking things off that had weight on them so that hopefully they could get higher in the water and would not crash. And, and, and they were getting near an island, okay? They said that just a minute ago. So they didn't know how deep the water was. They wasn't sure where even where they were at because look at verse 20. Now neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. They had done everything they could to save the ship. Everything. We're talking seasoned sailors here. We're talking merchant men that have been across these waters before. We're talking about experts in their field had done everything they had known to do, but they had just let it go. They had just let it go. And, and I'm just telling you, things look bad. Things look really bad really bad. And folks, can I say this to you today? Some of you have come here today and you are in a storm of life. Your world as you know it is just it's it's just it's beating you around. You prayed and you prayed and you prayed and it just seems like there's no hope and you you cry out to God at times. And even at times, I've heard people say, where is God in all this? Well, folks, let me tell you where He is. He's in heaven. And He's at the same place He was when He watched His Son be nailed to a cross. He gave up His Son for you. He knows where you're at. He knows you are hurting. And folks, the mistake that some people make is when they get through these storms in life, they just throw up their hands and they quit. They just quit. Folks, there is strength in the Lord. There is peace 
in the Lord. There is prayer in the Lord. There is fellowship with the Lord. You're never alone. And all this happened because a few guys would not wait. See, some of the storms we have in life is our own fault. We caused it because we, did, we didn't do what God asked us to do, and we just paid no attention to it. But folks, there's also storms that God puts in your life to test you. And if you remember, when you go through a test, the reason is for all things work together for good to those who, who are called according to His purpose. Everything works for a purpose in your life. And to have a testimony, T-E-S-T-I-O-M-O-N-Y, to have a testimony, it takes a test. God's not mad at you. God's not punishing you. He's saying, you are one of my warriors. You are one of my children. And what won't, what won't break you, folks, will make you stronger. You will come out of these storms stronger. One last scripture, Isaiah 40. Go with me to Isaiah 40. And I close with this. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known and have you not heard the everlasting God? Folks, he, he, you know, he spoke this world into existence and He'll always be God. God reigns on the throne. The Creator of the ends of earth. He, ne he neither faints nor is weary. God never gets tired. He never gets tired of hearing your prayers. Never. His understanding is unsearchable. Folks, sometimes when you can't see His hand, trust His heart. Trust His heart. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He, in strength, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Folks, you're stronger than you think you are. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives inside of you. Why? Because the God of this universe looks over you. Why? Because Jesus set the example that it can be done. It can be done. So folks, keep praying. Keep believing. Keep holding on. Stay strong in this storm of life. And if you're here today, there's one thing. I want to say, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that's one thing I would not wait on if I were you. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today, then say, Brother Mike, I don't have that inside of me. I've never put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, don't wait. Come to Christ today. Father, thank you. And God, I want to thank you for the storms in life. God, I know sometimes they just hurt. God, it's hard. But God, you are molding us. You are making us. You are giving us a testimony. And not only that, we are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. So God, I pray that we would just hang on. I pray that we would not doubt you or your power or who you are. I pray we would not doubt the Word of God. It is yes, it is amen, it is truth. And God, I pray that the Christian would rise up. Rise up. And God, I pray if there's one here that don't know you, I pray the Holy Spirit would just speak to them and say, man, go forward. Go forward. Talk to somebody about Jesus. Turn your life over to Jesus. Give your heart and your life to Jesus. He can and will change you. And God, maybe others need to rededicate their life or come for baptism or, or even join the church, God. This is your invitation. This is your time. God, I pray you do with it what you wish. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?
We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.